All right, great, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Elena Pinheiro. Uh, I'm working under Ryan Morrison at Colorado State University. I'm going to be talking about the decision support system, evaluating habitat and alternative flow scenarios that we created. We're working with the U.S. Forest Service and the USGS on this project. There is a need for environmental flow planning tools that incorporate both in-stream and floodplain habitats. Uh, studies and tools are typically biased towards fish, particularly high-value fish like salmon or endangered species. Um, flood plans provide essential services like habitat for those fish, um, flood protection and nutrient cycling. Uh, but fish, fish focused plans may not support flood plains um, because flood plans typically operate on longer life cycles and they depend more on interannual variability that may not be reflected in fish's life cycle. A uh, decision support system evaluating fish and plant vegetation was created. The purpose of this project was to evaluate habitat and alternative flow scenarios and also have a scalable and widely applicable tool so that um, USGS and US Forest Service didn't need to create a new tool every time they had a new project. Our objectives were to map uh, fish and vegetation habitat to determine changes in habitat and also describe those changes in habitat. Uh, I'll be demonstrating the DSS on the Verde Wild in Nick River in Arizona. It's in an arid setting. Uh, it's home to many threatened endangered species, fish, um, and terrestrial animals. And although it's a federally protected river, it is under pressure from development. Uh, this is a picture of um, one of the areas that we'll be working in on the river. The DSS is broken into four modules. The first was processing, followed by in-stream habitat processing, a time series analysis, and then scenario comparison. And I'll be talking about each one of these modules throughout my presentation. We use 2D hydrodynamic modeling um, to get high-resolution habitat maps. We worked in um, FastMac, which is part of the IREC suite, uh, and modeled a range of discharges with lowest and being lowest expected flow in the channel or in our scenarios, and the upper end being the highest um, expected flow in either scenarios or what is historically in record. And um, we had um, gridded results and then we rasterized them onto a five meter by five meter grid. And the curvilinear grid that's shown um, is an example of kind of how our sites are set up. So fish habitat is determined through habitat preference models. We um, fed in basically a range of depths, velocities, and substrates that were considered suitable uh, for the species that we were looking at, and everything outside of that range was considered unsuitable. So we went cell by cell in the rasterized modeling results to get um, suitable habitat uh, at every cell. And then we quantify that area to get a suitable habitat value discharge. So this is an example. Um, this is a, the Sonora Soccer Habitat at 6 CMS um, reaches about a meter, just to give you an idea of how much habitat is available. Um, and then once we qual uh, the habitat available at each discharge for every species, we're able to generate habitat area discharge curves. So we get um, a continuous um, curve of habitat at every discharge within the modeled range. Habitat is quantified for long term flow scenarios. For example, we worked with a Historic flow record from 1989 to 2008. We had two scenarios. The first was um, we took 25% off of all the flows that were above the median annual flow. In scenario B, we took 10% off um, all flows across the board. Daily fish habitat is summarized by minimum monthly 10 day habitat area. Uh, this We use 10 day running means, so we use the five days before the current day, 
the current day and the four days afterwards, and we got a single value for each month. This was considered a limiting amount of habitat in a month. We didn't want to um, over-represent a month if there were just one or two days with really high habitat area values. And it did take it a monthly um, habitat value to kind of get a little bit closer to be able to compare to vegetation. Vegetation probability of occurrence uh, was related to the probability of daily habitat inundation. Vegetation was broken into functional guilds, so they were grouped by the type of habitat that they utilized or the type of resource that they utilized. We started by calculating um, daily exceedance probability uh, for every flow in each scenario. And um, we reclassified our rasters um, based on whether or not they were wet into um, their exceedance probability. So we had um, ex daily exceedance probability at every cell in the rasters, like the the cerium black with the darker the cell, the higher the likelihood that it's going to be a wet cell. Um, and then based on the functional guilds relationship to its probability, we got probability of occurrence. So this is an example of the probability of occurring for cottonwoods where the darker areas have a higher probability of occurrence. We only got one map for every scenario. So this is the baseline scenario. Uh, scenarios were evaluated on their performance in three categories. Looked at percent change in habitat area, the balance of native and non-native fish habitat, and the potential of vegetation movement. And our scenario comparison was done in the last module in our DSS. Uh, monthly habitat change shows the effects of scenarios throughout the year. We broke fish habitat down by month um, so that it can be used to prioritize management targets. Um, things like spawning season are really important. Targets that need to be met. Uh, we also thought it was important to check the balance of um, habitat loss and gain throughout the year. For example, um, if you have a really large gain in habitat during spawning season, it could be canceled out by a loss of habitat during um, their growing period, which is late in the year. Um, like there is some rice suckers, um, monthly percent habitat change, and although they have a lot of habitat in um, the winter and the cooler months, during the summer, they actually lose a good bit of their habitat. And then the top figure shows all of the species that we considered. Uh, the native species are the top three. So when we put the fish, um, our, show all the species together, you can kind of compare um, how the natives are benefiting versus how the non-natives might be, be benefiting. Um, in important, especially on uh, the Murday River that we're looking at. Um, that the non-native are not benefiting too much here. Vegetation movement was another key indicator in scenario evaluation. Um, we classified vegetation movement into four different types of movement, basically whether it was moving away from the channel, um, encroaching on the channel, or extending or contracting its habitat. So one of the questions that people, our users, might be asked is, is an increase in habitat desirable if that vegetation is encroaching on the channel? And um, for example, is there a, um, the Cottonwood Functional Guild, it was gaining habitat, but it was actually encroaching on the channel. So that's an important trade-off to consider. The primary application of the DSS is trade-off evaluation through change in habitat availability. Um, when you're making environmental flow plans, um, you have to evaluate trade-offs and ultimately make compromises. And um, you have to balance the desirable and undesirable outcomes. 
we left the values up to the user. We didn't try to create any scores or um, composite um, metrics too heavily because um, those values may vary from system to system. Uh, we tried to provide um, just relevant metrics, good visuals for people to use. One limitation of the DSS is that habitat availability does not equal habitat utilization. Currently, we do not have um, any demographic model, so we can't account for things like competition, predation, or specific recruitment events. We're only able to tell what is available. Um, there's no way to know whether or not it's utilized. In the future, we plan to scale the DSS up to a web-based program. We'd like to expand its functionality um, to hopefully include a little bit larger range of life stages. So that I showed you all is mostly working with adult fish. Uh, we'd also like to have a robust uh, graphical user, inter user interface. Right now, I uh, wrote everything in R and it's just in its source code, but we would like something that's more easy to interact with. We also like to keep it open source. Uh, IREC, which is um, this is our suite that we used for the 2D hydrodynamic modeling is open source, and the rest of this is written in R, which is also open source. These are the resources that I use. Do you all have any questions? Wonderful. Thank you, Elena. So you can enter questions into the chat queue or raise your hand and I can turn your microphone on. We'll just wait a little bit, see if anything pops up. 